All right, so we're continuing on the series that I started last week on the, I call, last week I called them the attributes of God. We are going to be going into attributes as kind of a broader term, but we've been focused more on the characteristics of God, you know, what kind of what makes up God's character, who God is. So last week we looked at justice and judgment as, as part of God's character. He's, he's you know, all, all about justice and judgment, as well as anger and wrath and fury are all part of God's characteristic. He, these are things that, that make up who God is. These are, these are attributes or qualities that God has. And this morning we're going to be focusing in on grace and mercy. And like I said last week, you know, we're not doing any particular order of importance of which ones more than others last week the ones I picked is because I think that those tend to be overlooked and overshadowed too much by the grace and the love and the mercy as far as just people not having the proper understanding of who God is now grace and mercy I think are the greater attributes of God Obviously, without them, we'd be doomed. I mean, we, we have to have, these are essential for us to have as people and are extremely important and are important for us. And if we're putting an order of importance on things, I would categorize these above last week's. However, they're all important. Everything that makes up who God is, we ought to know about. We need to know who God is. We'll let the Bible define that for us. Now, we started off in Psalm 136. If you notice, what a, this is a great psalm. And, of course, the psalms are just, uh, it's a songbook. Obviously, it's still the Word of God. But that's why when you read this, after every single verse, you've got the phrase, For His mercy endureth forever. And this psalm is really a great praise and glory to God just highlighting God's infinite mercy that he has, that his mercy endures forever and ever and ever. And this, I mean, just every single statement that's being made here, for his mercy endureth forever, for his mercy, I mean, talk about hammering home a concept into your minds as you're singing a song, for his mercy endureth forever. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. Now, we, I only have, obviously, so many passages that we're going to turn to this morning, but this subject of mercy and grace is just all throughout Scripture. Uh, it's just, uh, there's no way we could barely even scratch the surface on how much this is mentioned in the Bible. So, I've got some passages we're going to look at, and we're going we're gonna to look at it as, as best as we can but one of the, before I even really get too started into all of this and, and we start looking at these passages, turn, if you would, to Exodus chapter 34. Uh, I'm not going to dig into Psalm 136. I just, we started with that because I just wanted you to get the, just see how every single verse is just ends with his mercy endureth forever. There's a lot of characteristics of God that are, that are interrelated and that are very, very close. So we're not going to give a, a separate sermon. I'm not going to preach a separate sermon for some of these characteristics that kind of can be grouped and bundled into one. Like grace and mercy are, are basically synonymous. They may not be exactly to the, to, to the finer points exactly the same, but uh, they're close enough that, that we're going to group those together. And long-suffering is going to go in with this as well. Um, all of these qualities or these attributes are, are very important and, and it's great to understand these things and to help us even just to be thankful to God when we realize how much grace and mercy he extends to us. And I think that starting off with the sermons last week will help us to be more appreciative of the grace and mercy that God has when we look at how much anger and wrath and fury and judgment that God has to be able to extend unto us sinners grace and mercy to not have to receive what we truly and justly deserve for our sins. So let's look here at um, Exodus 34. And another, th one other area, last week when we were talking about the judgment of God, there's a, there's a judgment seat that God has. There's a judgment seat that, that God sits on. But you know there's also a mercy seat that is, that is talked about all throughout the Bible as well. So God, you know, there's, there's two different seats that God can be sitting in. He's got a judgment seat and a mercy seat. And um, 
I, I, it just so, sorry, I'm trying to find the right words. It, it's just um, demonstrates these various qualities of God that, that are definitely unique and individual, but all make up and comprise who God is, that he's not all just one or the other. He's not all just mercy. He's not all just judgment. God encompasses mercy and judgment. And um, we're not even going to go into all the verses about the mercy seat in the, in the Old Testament, but that was another big thing. And you could look up uh, a lot about that. Look at Exodus 34, though. We're, look at verse number 5. The Bible reads, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Now, what's interesting in this passage is because you're going to find many people giving attributes unto God through God's word, which is still has authority. But here we see in verse six, it says the Lord passed before him and proclaimed. So this is God just speaking, the Lord proclaiming about himself. And this is what he says. It says and proclaimed. And then we have that comma. This is what he's saying. The Lord, the Lord God. So God's like announcing his presence, saying, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and announcing who he is. So as he's just, just proclaiming himself, hey, the Lord's here, and the Lord is merciful and gracious and long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. All great attributes, things that we ought to really, really, really love about God. But then he follows that up with the last part, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, on the third and the fourth generation. And he adds in there basically that part about his judgment. Lest you forget... You know, with all of this goodness and with all of this graciousness and with all of this mercy, let, you know, don't forget, hey, I'm still going to visit the sins. I'm still going to not hold them guiltless. And you say, well, how can that even be? How has that happened? Well, I mentioned this last week, but it's worth mentioning again. God can have his mercy and grace and long suffering while still being a just God. And there's, there's, it's, it's a multifaceted uh, quality of God. And even our sin is, is multifaceted as well. So what I mean by this is when we sin, first of all, there is an eternal punishment. There's an eternal judgment for our sin, which is hell, death, the lake of fire. Okay. That is an eternal punishment that we all deserve for our sins. Right. Jesus Christ came and made the payment in full and was punished for our sins to pay off that debt that we owe because of our sin, because we're guilty and we deserve to pay that debt. Jesus Christ came and paid that for us. That is one aspect, that is one element of, of sin and justice and judgment that is completely taken care of in God's plan for our salvation. That there's still judgment being executed. It's executed upon Jesus Christ for those that have accepted the payment that he made for us. And for those that have rejected the payment, then they pay for that themselves. However, there's also a justice and a judgment for God's children that is apart from the eternal consequences. That is apart from the punishment of hell. That is the temporal that is the, the 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 current you know when you're reaping what you sow when when you're doing wrong and, and you're going to have bad come upon you when god has to chasten you and discipline you 
for being disobedient and for going off and disobeying his commandments, there is also that element of, of justice and chastisement that, that God has. And in both cases, we can still seek the mercy of God. One, we receive mercy just once for all when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and he cleanses us from our sin and we receive the forgiveness of all of our sins, past, present, and future, of that eternal judgment, that fiery damnation that we won't have to face as a result of that. But the second aspect of God's mercy and his graciousness, and, and graciousness, that word grace, Grace is when you receive something that you don't deserve. It's not merited by you. It's that something that someone who loves you gives you and it's completely undeserved or unqualified by you. Grace, when you extend grace, and we explain this to people out soul winning, and I think this is an important uh, concept for people to understand because so many people today hear the term, you know, salvation is by grace through faith. Salvation by, you know, you get that, ha even churches that teach works-based salvation will say and, and give lip service to salvation by grace through faith. However, a lot of people, I think, n don't even stop to think about what that really means because, and the reason why I say it is because a lot of people, when you ask them, they'll tell you, well, you got to keep the commandments, you got to live like Christ, you got to follow Jesus, you got to do all this other stuff to be saved, right? So they'll say, oh no, salvation is by grace through faith. But then it's like, well, what does that entail? Well, I mean... You can't just do whatever you want. Well, you can't just do, you know, it's like, well, grace is unmerited. Grace is undeserving. If you're receiving something because you're kind of following God's law, then that's merited. That's something that you're receiving of your own works, of your own goodness, right? Your own obedience. Grace is something you receive that you don't deserve, but it's given anyways. Uh, one of the easiest ways, I think, to explain this to people, especially when we go out soul winning, is I like just using the concept of the grace period for making a payment. Everyone has bills to pay, right? You have rent due or you have mortgage payment or something along those lines. And typically, when it comes to rent or mortgage, you'll have your payment is due. If you look at your contract, if you look at the agreement you signed to, it's due on like the first of the month or the last day of the month or whatever. I'd right? say the first of the month. But almost everybody has just kind of become this standard and this norm that you'll receive a grace period of maybe five days, a week, two weeks, something along those lines to where, okay, they didn't receive payment on the first, but, you know, if you get it to them on the third or the fifth, they're not going to charge you anything. They're not going to hold you liable, responsible for being late with your payment, even though the payment's due on the first. And that's just giving you grace. That's just saying, yeah, okay, you know, I forgive you for, for not having it paid on the first. And people, I think, often even just lose the concept of this because it's become just a standard and a norm without realizing, you know, they really don't have to do that for you. They don't have to extend extra time and weeks for you to make your payment that you agreed to pay. God's given us a law to follow. And it's not suggestions, they're commandments. And he says, this is what you need to follow. And if you don't, there's judgment and there's punishment. Yet because God is long-suffering and merciful, especially with his children, when we transgress God and we are repentant and we go to God and say, God, show mercy on me. God will do that because he has so much mercy and long suffering. Now, there's obviously a point to which God's going to say, no, I'm not going to extend my mercy to you anymore. Or, uh, you know, it's, it's, you're not going to receive it. But one of the things that you're going to notice as we go through this, or one of the things that I noticed when I was studying for the sermon, I really looked, tried to look up a lot of passages that talk about God's mercy, His grace, and all these different attributes. One thing you'll find is that man is very often entreating God for mercy. The children of God are going to God and say, God, be merciful unto me. God, be merciful. God, please show me your mercy. God, extend your mercy unto us. And this is a heart and an attitude that we ought to entreat for because we're not perfect and we ought to recognize our sin and recognize when we do wrong and seek and entreat the mercy of God 
Because God is merciful. And my favorite illustration that we have in Scripture and, and the, the relationship that we have with God is one of a, of a father and a child. And you really understand this with your own children or even just being a child yourself where the parents will show mercy on their children even when they're deserving of a punishment or of some type of discipline. When the child shows that, that hey, they understand they've done wrong, they're trying not to do it. You know, it's not, it's not fake. They're not just saying what they, what they think they, you want to hear, but they're, they're really repentant. Then oftentimes parents ought to show mercy. Now, not all parents do, but most parents do, I think, and, and we ought to. We ought to be demonstrating the qualities, you know, that, that our Father in Heaven shows upon us. I'm all for having good discipline in the house. I'm all for children showing respect under their parents and that when they, you know, when they need the rod of correction and then they're given the rod of correction. But we have to balance that out with grace and mercy as well. I mean, you have to do that. You, you, can't, you cannot just always be coming down so hard on your kids with every single slight infraction that they have that you're just coming down, coming down, coming out without showing them and exhibiting any level of grace and mercy and long suffering with them, because that's going to destroy them. We, you know, we need to have that grace and mercy. We need to show them that you know the way that we behave really ought to be patterned off of God. And He's given us a lot of mercy and grace, and we ought to be able to extend that to our children. Now, at the same time, the Bible says that the Lord chastens every son whom He receives. So I'm not saying everything is mercy. This is where you get into problems when you just take things too far to extreme. When people say, oh, God's just love and mercy and grace, and then they just throw out the law and just pretend like, well, we're, we're free from the law. We're under grace, so we can do whatever we want. And that's just fine. That's ridiculous. You can't do that. That's going to make God angry, and you're going to incur God's anger and fury in your life if you just decide to say, well, nuts to God's law because we're under grace. I mean, if my kids just said, well, because my dad loves me so much and he's just so merciful, then I'm just going to go and do whatever I want. No, no, <laughs> you're not. Now, when they do something wrong and, and I could tell they're sorry for it, you know what, maybe I will take it easy on them and extend mercy and grace. But you have to have the proper balance, and the Bible teaches us how to have that balance. Let's turn over to Nehemiah chapter 9. We're going to see, Nehemiah chapter 9 gives us a really good summary of how God dealt with the children of Israel when, after he brought them out of Egypt, and they're, they're wandering around in the wilderness. To get a really good idea of the extent of God's mercy and God's long-suffering, long mixed in with his judgment on the children of Israel because both happen here. But Nehemiah chapter 9 is a really good job of, of not having to go back and read like the whole Old Testament up to that point to see everything that was going on. He is a really good job of encapsulating kind of what was going on here and how much mercy God extended unto the children of Israel, even though they were, they were making some, some pretty bad mistakes. Look at verse number 12 in Nehemiah chapter number 9. That's where we're going to start reading. The Bible says, Moreover, thou lettest them in the day by a cloudy pillar, and in the night by a pillar of fire, to give them light in the way wherein they should go. Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai, and spakest with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments and true laws, good statutes and commandments, and madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath, and commanded the, them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses thy servant, and gavest them bread from heaven for their hunger, and broughtest forth water for them out of the rock for their thirst, and promised them that they should go in to possess the land which thou had sworn to give them. So right off the bat, without even specifically mentioning it by name, the fact that God delivered the children of Israel from bondage, from being in slavery, from being oppressed, 
brought them through, you know, parted the Red Sea, made the, the impossible possible, and just brought them out with that strong arm and completely protected them while the plagues were being brought on Egypt and protected them from the armies of Pharaoh, protected them from the Egyptians, brought justice and judgment upon their enemies when he swallowed up the soldiers that were following him in the sea and brought them forth. When they're going through the wilderness, he's given them food, he's given them water, he's giving them and providing for all of their needs. Right off the bat, we see there the mercy and the love of God that he's extending unto the children of Israel to bring them to this point. And it says even giving them the laws. I mean, giving them the knowledge and knowing right from wrong and, and this is what you need to do. This is, these aren't bad things. Giving someone the law is not a bad thing. You know, a lot of times people might have a, dis, a natural disdain for the law. Like, oh man, because these days it's like everything's against the law. I mean, you can't do anything without breaking the law. You probably break the law five times in a day because we have so many stinking laws on the books in this country. But that's not the way that God's law operates. God has not that many laws. <laughs> you compare it to government laws, it's not even close to the same thing. God's laws are very simple, and they're good. The law of the Lord is perfect. The law of the Lord is great. We ought to love God's law because it gives us so much good instruction on how we need to live our life. And, and God really does care about us and loves us to tell us, don't get involved with this. This is sin. This is bad. This will destroy you. This will bring death. This is going to cause misery and pain, not only unto you, but unto others. Stay away from this stuff. Walk this way. Walk in the light. Walk on the straight path. Walk this direction. This is going to bring you joy and pleasure in your life. This is going to make your life fulfilling. He's given them this. That alone, I think, is, is extremely kind and generous of God to just give us all of this information on how we ought to live. But continuing on here in this passage, it says in verse 16, After all these great things that God did for them, but they and our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks and hearkened not to thy commandments. He's saying, but they didn't listen and refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them. But hardened their necks, and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. He's saying, they didn't even think about all the great miracles that you performed. They hardened their neck, they hardened their heart, and they're just like, no. And it got to the point to where like, well, we're just going to go back in Egypt. And they were appointing a kid. They were self-appointing someone and, and rejecting the, the leader that God ordained for them and saying, no, no, we don't want that leader, God. We want to make up our own leader and he's going to bring us back into bondage. And you know, that's what happens when people want to just make up their own rules and make up their own leaders and not worry about God's, you know, what God has planned and what God has ordained. It's going to lead them back into bondage. It's going to lead them back into sin. It says, but look at this. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and forsookest them not. At a point where it would be completely righteous for God to say, okay, you want to go back into bondage that soon? Fine. Have at it. I'm done with you. I've, I've done so much for you. Go ahead. Go back in Egypt if you want to go back in Egypt. Go ahead. But that's not part. God, the Bible says that God was still ready to pardon. Even after all of that, God loves his people so much. Even when they're just screwing up so bad and being resistant and being rebellious, in his heart, he still wants them to come back to him. He's ready to pardon. Now, does it just say he automatically pardons? No. It says he's ready to pardon. He's ready to show his grace and his long suffering. And in so doing, being slow to anger of great kindness, he doesn't completely forsake them. See, they don't get a pardon if they don't come back to him, but he's, he's willing to hold off on bringing his punishment and bringing... The, the negative things upon the children of Israel because of his long suffering, because of his mercifulness and his graciousness and giving them this grace period 
where they're well extended beyond when they should have just been like, yeah, we're going to follow you, God. You know, how about way back when, I don't know, when they first started seeing <laughs> the miracles that God was performing or, or maybe when they first, you know, when he led them across the Red Sea, when he, when he you know, you could, you could pick out all these different points where it should have been like, yeah, that's when your payment was due. And he continues to show this grace of allowing them to be in rebellion without just hammering down his strong arm on them. Verse 18, Yea, when they had made them a molten calf and said, This is thy God that brought thee up out of Egypt and had wrought great provocations, Yet thou, in thy manifold mercies, forsookest them not in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way wherein they should go. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them and withheldest not thy manna from their mouth and gavest them water for their thirst." Nehemiah is recognizing God's grace that even when they got to the point of making these idols, when Moses is up receiving the Ten Commandments from God and they're making up these idols, God still has enough mercy and graciousness to still feed them and to make sure they have food and water and they're able to be sustained. Do they deserve that? Absolutely not. But God is extending mercy and grace out of his love for them to continue to allow them to, to exist. And I think all of us can probably say, you know, hey, thank God for his graciousness and his mercy and his long suffering. I don't know about you, but I know just in my own life, up until the point that I was saved, and then even, of course, after I was saved, how many times I was rebellious and sinful and just doing wrong Yet, I feel like I never received everything that is coming to me or that should be coming to me because God has, has showed mercy and grace and extended that to a point to allow us to be able to come back to him instead of completely wiping us out because it is in God's heart that his people would come back and listen to him and follow him. And that's why you see Psalms like the one we started off with because it's for his mercy endureth forever. And that that is just something to be magnified and glorified. And something, by the way, we should never, ever, ever forget. Don't ever let yourself get lifted up in pride. You know, it, the more you, and, and you know, I might sound like a broken record, but the more people clean up their lives, praise God. The more people you get, you get sin out of your life and you start walking righteously. That is awesome. That is great. That is what God wants you to do. But don't forget where you've come from, what you've been pulled out of. This is what one of the problems that the children of Israel have. This is a problem that human beings have in general. This is a problem that our nation has. Right now, we're experiencing it. We see these snowflake generations have had everything given to them and handed to them on silver platters and everything done for them. And they've gotten to the point of just expecting everything and become like a bunch of spoiled brats and live in this entitlement society. And, and it's all about them. It all ties together. And we need to be careful that we don't fall into the same trap when we're being out of sin for a while, especially certain sins, real bad sins, you know, to forget where you might have come from. And to be able to show mercy unto people that are deserving of mercy, well, actually not deserving, but to the extent that God shows mercy unto us, how about we show mercy unto people? And, you know, when, when our, as our church grows... We have to have the balance, right? The balance of 1 Corinthians chapter 5 where we're not going to tolerate a brother being in specific sins. But at the same time, when they repent, they're welcome right back in with loving arms. And then also when you have people who are new believers and they're growing, we're not looking down our noses on the people who, you know what, they may have a lot of problems in their life. 
They might have a lot of sins that they're dealing with. They just got saved. Let's show some mercy and compassion and grace and help them along so that they can get, you know, they may not be anywhere close to where you are spiritually speaking. That's fine because they're a babe in Christ. Don't disdain the babes in Christ. Show mercy. Extend that, that sympathy in the, in the, in the long-suffering that God has shown and has shown unto us. And, and well, I'm not going to continue on. Let's, let's keep reading here. Verse number 21. Yea, forty years didst thou sustain them in the wilderness, so that they lacked nothing. Their clothes waxed not old, and their feet swelled not. Moreover, thou gavest them kingdoms and nations, and didst divide them into corners, so they possessed the land of Sion, and the land of the king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. Their children also multipliest thou as the stars of heaven, and broughtest them into the land concerning which thou hadst promised to their fathers that they should go in to possess it. So the children went in and possessed the land, and thou subduest before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gavest them into their hands with their kings and the people of the land, that they might do with them as they would. And they took strong cities and a fat land, and possessed houses full of all goods, wells digged, vineyards, and oliveyards, and fruit trees in abundance. So they did eat, and were filled, and became fat, and delighted themselves in thy great goodness." All these good things that God did for these people, right, gave them everything. Gave them these cities and houses and the wells were already digged and the vineyards were already planted. He said, here you go. The work's been done for you. Welcome to the promised land. Wow, what, what, a, great, what a great gift. Now, did they say, thanks, God. Now, I mean, this is awesome. We're humbled we're going to live for you. Well, look at verse 26. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee. And cast thy law behind their backs and slew thy prophets, which testified against them to turn them to thee. And they wrought great provocations. So as God is sending people to say, hey, get on the right path. You're disobeying. You're being, you know, you're, you're, you're being rebellious. They take those people and they kill them. That's some serious rebellion. And now we're going to see here in verse 27 that while God is merciful, and we're even going to see his manifold mercies mentioned here, it's not just that, it, he, it's not that there's no uh, consequences for their actions either. Look at verse 27. Therefore thou deliveredst them into the hand of their enemies. So because of these things, God says, okay, now you're going to be chastised. Now you're going to be punished who vexed them. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven. And according to thy manifold mercies, thou gavest them saviors who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. So while they are deserving of punishment, God brings punishment on them. He brings in other nations to judge them. But because God still is full of mercy, when they turn to God and say, God, help us, he provides the savior for them and then delivers them out of that affliction, out of that persecution to, uh, to come back in a good standing with him. But verse 28, But after they had rest, they did evil again before thee. Therefore left us out of them in the hand of their enemies, so that they had the dominion over them. Yet when they returned and cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven, and many times didst thou deliver them according to thy mercies. So we see God that... that one of his great characteristics is how many times he's going to continue and show mercy when people come back to him. Just like when his disciples asked, Lord, how oft shall my brother you know, sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times? He said, I say not unto you until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Why? Because that's how much God has mercy and forgiveness and, and long-suffering that when people, when, when his people, when they're going to come back to him, he's ready to hear. He's ready to pardon. He has the mercy available. It says in verse um, 29, And testifies against them that thou mightest bring them again unto thy law. 
Yet they dealt proudly and hearkened not unto thy commandments, but sinned against thy judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. And withdrew the shoulder and hardened their neck and would not hear. Yet many years didst thou forbear them and testifiest against them by the Spirit and thy prophets, yet would they not give ear. Therefore gavest thou them into the hand of the people of the lands. Nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, thou didst not utterly consume them, nor forsake them. For thou art a gracious and merciful God. Now therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, and the terrible God, who keep his covenant and mercy, let not all the trouble seem little before thee that hath come upon us, on our kings, on our princes, and on our priests, and on our prophets, and on our fathers, and on all thy people since the time of the kings of Assyria unto this day. And that last verse that we just read there, verse number 32, Nehemiah is saying, he, he's appealing to God's mercy once more. He's appealing to God, saying, God, he's recognizing, look, we've done wrong time and time and time again, and you've extended your graciousness, your mercy unto us. We don't deserve it, yet you continue to show us mercy. And now, he, after this whole long summary in verse 32, he says, Now, therefore, God, the great, the mighty, the terrible God, who keepeth covenant and mercy, let not all the trouble seem little before thee that hath come upon us. He's saying, we've been through a lot, God, so please, please don't, don't downplay what we've been through. We get it. You punished us. It's not been a small thing. You've punished us enough is what Nehemiah is saying. We get it. Please don't, don't think it's just a, a light affliction or a little bit that we've had. Extend us your mercy again as you have in times past. And this is the entreaty. And you know what? We need to continue to go back to God in our lives. God forbid that any one of you would, would get wrapped up in a sin that would be a really grievous sin, right? Something that's just, just a really bad sin. You know, I hope that never happens to anyone here. But if it does, entreat God. Go back. Don't harden your neck. Don't continue down the wrong path because you go, oh man, well, I've really screwed up this time. Well, there's not much hope for me now. I'm just going to continue on this path. Don't do that. God is merciful. We entreat God for mercy. That's why King David, when he commit horrible sin, adultery and murder, okay, I mean, like, how, how much worse are you going to get? Really, 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 really bad sin. And he received for that. God punished him. But God still extended mercy on him. But even David said, when he's entreating for the child's life, he's fasting and he's weeping and he's mourning. And he says, well, who knows if the Lord will be gracious. Now, God took the life of that child, but we need to have that heart and that attitude that even when you sin bad, where you go back to God and say, you know what? I know God could be merciful and just, and just, just kind of offer yourself up and say, here I am, God. I'm sorry. You know, I, I, I'm repentant, but please extend some mercy unto me. And God did show, even what David had to be punished for what he did, and he was, and he was, with his children. But he still was shown mercy and kept his life. <laughs> God could have just struck him dead, even though he's the king. So who's going to raise his hand to the king? God, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, who, who has all of our breath, in his hand, and he can just, in a, in a second, in a heartbeat. He extended mercy unto David. But see, David had the right heart and the right attitude of going back to God. Don't forget God's mercy. I, I man, and I, and I think what it is, it's pride, really, that boils down to people not wanting to turn to God. I remember when I was younger, when I was newly saved, and I'd try to talk to some of my old friends, my old buddies, we'd be hanging out in the street or whatever. And um, I remember one guy in particular, I was trying to talk to him just about God, about Jesus, and say, hey, man, you know, God can forgive you. 
Like, like go to God. And I wasn't, I didn't really know how to do soul winning. I didn't really know how to explain the gospel to people. I'm just trying to like, just tell them about God and tell them about the Bible. But I remember his attitude is just, he basically was just like, no, he's like, well, why, you know, kind of like, why should I burden God with my stuff? And why should, you know, just, just wanting to do everything on his own. And on one hand, that could be a commendable attitude in general of just owning up for your own responsibilities and doing things and kind of working and just taking responsibility for yourself. But on the other hand, it's really foolish when it comes to you breaking God's laws and his commandments because you need to go to him. You need to entreat for mercy. You can't undo what you've done. You have to go back to him and just and, and call on the name of the Lord and ask him for mercy on your soul. And put your faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that's going to work. He didn't really, he didn't want to do that. And unfortunately, there's people who will say that that'll mock what we believe. And, oh, you believe in that easy believism. Yes. Yes, I do. Amen and amen. Because it is easy. It wasn't easy for Jesus. But you know what? It's easy for us. It's easy to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because that's, and that's all you have to do. Anything more than that is work. And the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For by grace, grace, God's grace, God giving you something you don't deserve. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. We're going to see in Psalm 103, as well as in Psalm 86, we're going to go there next, just God's mercy and his grace for our salvation, for us to even be saved. The amount of mercy that he extends unto us to provide us with our own salvation. Psalm 103, starting in verse number 8, the Bible says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Now, we're going to see also in this passage that God's mercy is not unconditional. It's not unconditional. There is a condition to receive God's mercy. And when you have a wicked heart and when you have a rebellious and a stubborn heart, God is ready to pardon, but he doesn't pardon. God's ready to extend mercy, but the mercy isn't quite given until you are repented of heart. Look at what it says here. Um, so great is mercy toward them that fear him. So God has great mercy towards those that fear him. Verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. This is talking about you being saved. God has separated you completely from your sin. He says he has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities in verse 10. That's God's mercy and his grace. Why? Because there came a point where you feared God and you feared the punishment of your sins and called on, Lord, on the Lord to save you <clears throat> and to give you that mercy that you were seeking. Look at verse number 13 here. It says, Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children to such as keep his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do to do them abigail will you bring my water up to me please 
we see here God showing mercy and how great his mercy is that he doesn't, he doesn't deal with us after our sins nor reward us according to our iniquities, separates as far as the east is from the west our sins from us. And as a father pitieth his children, thank you, he pities us, it says, but he pities them that fear him. He, keeps, he, he shows his mercy to such as keep his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them. Turn over, if you would, to Psalm 86. Psalm 86, I in verse number one, the Bible reads, Bow down thine ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. O thou, my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. Rejoice the soul of thy servant, for unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee unto all them that call upon me. You need to call upon God. You need to seek and entreat God for His mercy in order to receive it. God is long-suffering in general where He's not just super quick to trigger. But if you want to receive mercy for what you've done wrong, you need to seek God. You need to call on God. Now, whether it be calling on God for your salvation eternally, or just calling on God for your temporal salvation from being chastised over sins that you've done where God needs to correct you and you say, God, I get it. Please, please show mercy on me. We need to have this type of a heart and this type of an attitude regularly to prevent us from being lifted up and getting all full of ourselves. Look at verse number six. Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer and attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon thee for thou wilt answer me. And I love the confidence, too. We ought to have the same confidence to go to God, knowing who God is. We can pray to God as these prayers are that we see in the Psalms, as we see in other places. God, you're a merciful God. You've demonstrated that. You've shown that to, to us. Please be merciful unto me. Entreat God when you need mercy. And you can ask for it boldly. And, and, and bring up who God is to God. Remind him. Not that he needs our reminder, but this is the example we see set forth over and over and over and over again throughout Scripture. God, you're a merciful God. You're slow to anger. God, please be merciful to me. Among the gods there is none like unto thee. Verse 8, O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. O God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of violent men have sought after my soul and have not set thee before them. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. O turn unto me and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant and save the son of thine handmaid. Show me a token for good that they which hate me may see it and be ashamed because thou, Lord, hast helped in me and comforted me. Our salvation comes only through the grace and the mercy of God. Titus 3, 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Hebrews chapter 4, we see another opportunity here. Actually, turn if you would to, to Romans 11. Romans 11. We're almost done. I just want to tie this up real quickly. Hebrews 4.14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, 
but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. We can come boldly, as I was just saying, unto God, unto the throne of grace. You don't want to come boldly unto the throne of judgment. You come boldly unto the throne of grace. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We need God's grace. We need it. We need God to show us that, that mercy because we all screw up. None of us here are perfect. I don't think you need me to remind you of that. Going to God and asking for mercy will help your heart be in the right place, though, by the way, and will keep you more mindful of the things that you do wrong so that you could not do them again. So you can avoid falling into that same trap and that same sins. Have a, have a heart ready to seek God and seek mercy so that, you know, when God's working in you and you're going to God seeking for mercy, and look, I've had this happen before. You're going to start to feel like a hypocrite if you keep asking for the same thing over and over and over again. And it's going to make you look into your own heart and say, you know, I'm asking for mercy, but I don't know if I really feel like I'm repenting of, of whatever the sin is because I keep, I keep finding myself back in the same situation. And this exercise is not futile because you need to be able to, to identify that within yourself so that you're not just deceiving yourself by saying the right thing because you know what to say. Because you know what you've done is wrong. And just giving the lip service to God, oh God, I'm sorry. But deep down in your heart, you're not really because you know you're just going to do it again. I'm not saying don't go to God. Keep going to God. But as you do so, be cognizant, be thinking. Am I just going to find myself right back here again? Because if I am, this, this, this needs to change. I need to, I need to stop this now. I need, you know, if I really expect God to show mercy on me, then I really need to put forth the effort to change whatever it is that I'm asking mercy for. And not just, and not just do this like, the, like you see so often in the Catholic Church. You're, go, you're going out, getting drunk on Saturday night, showing up and confessing your sins on Sunday and just keep, repeat the cycle, Right? And it's, and it's just uh, to make you feel good instead of being serious in tree. I mean, when you talk to God and entreat his mercy, look, it should be real. And if it's real, then you need to start, instead of just always asking for mercy, try to change so you don't have to keep asking for the mercy, at least in those areas. Now, thank God... When it comes to his grace and his mercy for our salvation of our souls, we don't have to get everything right in our life. He's not going to withhold mercy from you not, oh man, I, I'm still not getting this right. I'm still not getting this right. Because you're never going to get all of that right. That's for the temporal chastising. That's different from the eternal salvation. Romans 11.6 makes it very, very clear that God's grace has nothing to do with our works in regards to our souls being saved, just, and just, even just by definition. Definition of grace versus works. Works is, you can't have both. It's one or the other. Grace is just a gift, something that's, that's undeserved and, and unmerited. Work is something that is merited. It's something that you do for it. Verse uh, 6 of Romans 11, And if by grace, then is it no more of works. So if something's grace, if it's undeserved, then it's, then it's not works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. So it can't be grace then. If you have some element of work that needs to be involved in what you're calling grace, it's not grace. It's, it's not what grace is. Oh, we're saved by grace through faith and you have to be baptized. 
Well, hold on a second. You've just added a work. That's not grace anymore. I know you keep saying it's salvation by grace through faith. I don't think that word means what you think it means. If by grace, it's no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it's no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. It's like my paycheck. When I go to my job and I work, that's not grace. I get paid every two weeks. It's not like, oh, I'm going to extend my grace on you and, and give you this money. <laughs> Hold on a second, buddy. I worked for that. Now, now you're just basically saying I didn't work at all. <laughs> and don't, don't be in that situation either where you are getting a, a, a grace paycheck because you haven't worked when you ought to be working. That's a whole nother sermon, right? Romans 4, we'll sum it up with this. Romans chapter 4, verse number 4. Many of you probably know it if you don't want to turn to you on after. Romans 4, 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. When you work and you receive something for your work, that's a debt. That's owed to you because you've worked. That is not grace. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Working not means it's grace. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without work, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Praise God for his grace and making our salvation not of works at all. Completely bought and paid for, which is a free gift. This just accentuates the love that God has for us. The fact that he has mercy, long-suffering, and grace to us shows you what a truly loving God that we have. But it's hard to, to see the full uh, benefit of God's mercy without understanding his wrath and his anger and his judgment and his fury. When you understand the one, it really makes the other one that much more powerful. How powerful would grace be if there was just no penalty at all? How much would you care about a grace period for your mortgage if you're just like, yeah, I'm just not going to pay this month. And, well, and I'm not going to pay next. Hey, just keep on giving me that grace because I'm just going to not pay ever. There's no, if there's no consequence, it's meaningless. No, the fact that there is a consequence, yeah. Try not paying your mortgage for a while and you'll see the consequences of that. You're going to first start piling up the late fees. And then they're going to take your house if it goes long enough. That's why the grace period even means something. Because you're not going to get any penalties. That's why God's grace means something. Because he has a law and a judgment and, and penalties. I'm going to close on this last verse. You don't have to turn there. It's, Hebrew, it's Hosea 10, 12. Well, I, was studying, I, I like this verse. It's a, it's a real interesting verse. The Bible says, Sow to yourselves, sow, like sowing a seed, sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. Sow in righteousness. Do right. Do good. Follow God's commandments. Keep your heart right. And then, when you're reaping, reap in mercy. Be long-suffering and merciful as you go and reap. You're sowing, you're keeping yourself right, and you're reaping in mercy. These are the attributes of God. God is holy. God is perfect, right? But God shows mercy unto others. We should be keeping ourselves good and, and pure and, and righteous and, and so going out and sowing and doing the work and sowing in righteousness. But hey, let's extend that mercy unto others and, and reap in mercy the attitude that we need to have. This is definitely an attitude where we can be, you know, we, we saw last week, vengeance belongeth unto God. We don't need to have that attribute of God, that characteristic of God. That's, God is the one that's going to be vengeful, not us. But when it comes to grace and mercy, the Bible says that God shows himself merciful to those that are merciful. You read the, the Beatitudes, you read Matthew chapter 5, you read many other places in the Bible that basically the amount of mercy that you show unto others is the amount of mercy that you're going to get. 
This is something that we ought to exemplify in our lives. Grace, mercy, long-suffering. Let's show people who God is and just show our children who God is through our, not only our discipline, but also our mercy and our long-suffering with them as well. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for all the instruction, for who you are, God, for, for all of your love and grace and mercy, and that you, you don't just leave us or forsake us. And um, God, I pray that you would please extend mercy upon us especially as, as we continue to, to strive to do our best to, to obey your commandments. Lord, we love your law. We, we, we're trying to, to do right, and we're asking for your guidance, for your mercy, for your patience with us. Lord, help us to exhibit the same level of love and mercy and, and long-suffering that you have for us on others. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.